it's an <coughs> it's another choking Thursday night. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do uh, not have the Mexican beer virus. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I am quite capable of choking on my own spit without it. It's another Thursday night. Welcome to Real Monsters. I'm your host, S.K. Barrett. Joining me, as always, the lovely, the talented, Wes Hobrick. Hello, hello, hello. And we have, you know, it's it's almost, (laughs) we keep saying, so this is going to be a strange one. But that's like every week almost. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it certainly seems so. Um, this is this is modern day cannibalism and not fiction. <laughs> no, this is ripped from the headlines. Yeah. Oh, back in 2001. But first, I forgot to ask, do we have some history to go over? Yeah, I got a little bit of things in the news here. Kind of interesting, our show last week was all about stupid deaths. Right. And right after we aired that one, there was a guy who died after his rooster attacked him on the way to a cockfight in India. Wow. (laughs) Which the um, one that we had talked about on the show, the guy got his, I believe it was his femoral artery slashed by a razor. I thought you said it was his carotid. He oh, had, maybe it was. He held the rooster up to his face, and the rooster roundhouse kicked him with his razor blades. <laughs> uh, apparently, the same thing happened here, but this guy had his jugular slashed by the blades on wow. the bird's feet. So, good riddance there, definitely. Uh, rise, of the, rise of the roosters. <laughs> <laughs> Take the power back. Yeah. Let's see. Pastor in North Carolina charged with more than 100 felony sex crimes against children. Jesus. That guy, in fact, was um, a contributor to Alex Jones's website for a long time, too. Infowars. Shock. Yeah. Nuts. And by shock, I I mean not shock. (laughs) Yeah, this uh, this other headline it was so weird. It's just so bizarre. I didn't know what to think about it. But a driver was stuck by a hypodermic needle hidden under a pump at an Alabama gas station. Somebody put it in there and taped it there. So for for real? Because, you know, there's a lot of urban legends about shit like that. But this really happened? Yes, this is on our page. From their local um, news station, WHNT. Hmm. Yeah, whenever I have something up there, I always go for the best source that we can grab. The yeah. uh, one that's closest to the news that happened. You know, it almost kind of struck me like the uh, Tylenol poisonings, that same sort of psychology at play. Yeah, except, just wanna... except almost every gas station has pump cameras nowadays. Well, that's true. They should have some clue what's going on. Who did it? There. Yeah, I'll definitely keep the eyes open for that, and we'll update if we see anything. But, um, oh yeah, the wheels got stolen off of a Corvette Stingray test vehicle (laughs) when somebody parked it in Detroit. Well, okay. (laughs) Well, there's so many things wrong with that statement. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, they're going to test it. And they, this is for those of you who don't know, um, one of the things the car companies do is they will cover their car with, ident- with like paper or plastic to hide identifying elements of it. So you'll have oh. like just the windows and lights visible. And so, oh. so that they can drive it around town. And not have people snap and pics and say, oh, here's the upcoming model of whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure parking it, it goes against the rules. (laughs) (laughs) I would think so, yeah. I'm going to guess somebody is, uh, you know, in the unemployment line today. Yeah, I would certainly hope so with something like that. And why 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 didn't the tire thieves 
rip the paper off and take pictures of it and break that news. Oh, but then they stole the tires, so there would be that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you always get that effect anyway. It's newsworthy, you know, in and of itself when they took the tires on that, and that gets the pictures out. But, yeah, I don't know whose bright idea that was, but yeah, I get there. Yeah, oopsie. Stopped to get, smack in the stopped head. Stopped for a booty call and ends up losing the job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Let's see. Nicki Minaj's brother sentenced to 25 years to life for child rape. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Um, Oh, yeah. Federal prosecutors are... um, I'm not sure if they're serving a particular type of legal paper. I don't know how you would do it in this case, but federal prosecutors in New York have asked to interview Prince Andrew... As part of the uh, Epstein probe. Yeah. <laughs> Probably not going to get much out of that. But... Nope. Um, yeah, because all they've got is, I mean, they just, the Queen's just got to say, um, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But let's see. Oh, yeah, Woodland, California. That was January 28th. A father arrested in the killings of five of his infant children over about um, 20 to 30 years. This was another case that was solved with the uh, DNA, with the new DNA thing. You don't hear about dads having, I mean, if a father kills their kids, it's usually a spree. And not, Mm -hmm. not like this. This sounds a lot like Munchausen's or some variation of that, right? Well, you know, that could be up until he killed them, but in Munchausen, you don't see the body disposal like they did here. Right. This guy, he literally, um, one of the infants was beaten to death. He literally put the body in a plastic tub, weighted down with rocks, and dropped it in a lake. Wow. There was a uh, fisherman who was spear fishing for carp at the time. And he um, accidentally hit the box and brought it out. And let's see that. Yeah, that was about ten years ago. And then they added it how to these you, others. How do you explain I guess. these kids just disappearing? Good question. I don't know. Definitely something we'll keep up with during the trial, yeah. though. Um. Oh, yeah, a high-profile murder case hinges on an alibi involving a googly-eyed grocery store robot named Marty <laughs> in Connecticut. You know, I guess the, the surveillance state can giveth and the surveillance state taketh away. Yeah. Michelle Troconis was arrested earlier this month in connection with the disappearance of Jennifer Dulos, a Connecticut woman who went missing in May. Traconos was charged with conspiracy to commit murder, and part of her alibi for the day of Dulos's disappearance involves a trip to a Simsbury, Connecticut stop and shop where Traconis said she took a photo with Marty, the googly-eyed cleanup assisting robot that roams the aisles of hundreds of stop and shop stores. Hmm. I have never been to that chain. I've never heard of it, no. Yeah, me neither until then. But, um, let's see, I thought we had one more item here. Oh, yeah, this guy was pretty legendary. In Tennessee, a guy gets arrested for pot possession and lights up his joint right in front of the judge (laughs) in the court. It's so hard to tell. Is he... You know, a gutsy genius hero or just an idiot? It's yeah, such a fine it, line. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the effect, I guess, is the same no matter what caused him to do no, it. No, I'm not guilty. <laughs> <laughs> Making a statement. That, oh, yeah, a woman stabs her attacker in the head with a box cutter and chases him after he tries to rape her. Yay, good that job. That was pretty awesome. Yep. I think that is all we got for this week. 
This Week in Crime History, brought to you by Weirdos Everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they give us and they keep on giving. in. All right. It's time to make our warning. We don't have to do this every week, but goddamn, we sure do today. Yeah. This is some weird, do. disturbing shit and some very graphic images. So if you're bothered by that stuff, um, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> yeah, hey, that is a good question. Some of these stills are from an actual video of a human being being butchered and torn apart for his meat, literally. Yeah. Cannot get much more literal than that. But people may have heard about this case. This was the uh, Cannibal of Rotenburg in Germany. Happened in 2001, where a guy quite literally solicited somebody that he could eat online, and there was somebody who answered that call. The uh, murder itself, if you can call it that, the killing, happened on March 9th, 2001, with Armin Mavis, age 39, a computer um, technician. He had a really interesting childhood. When you get into this, there's so many parallels with Ed Gein's childhood specifically. But he uh, grew up in a small town in the heart of West Germany, uh, Wusterfeld. And there is, this town was so tiny, there's only 25 people in it. Wow. And Armin's house was one of seven. It's a 40, although it's weird. I was looking at some of the sources here, and the um, estimation of the number of rooms varied from like 36 to 44. So they could have fit the whole damn town in the house. Oh, yeah. It was gigantic. And the house itself was about 700 years old on top of it. Um. They had uh, bought it initially as a retreat when they um, were living in Essen, Germany, which also isn't far. Wait, hold on a second. (laughs) I have to look something up because I think Essen means to eat. (laughs) Yeah, it does. It does, actually. (laughs) Uh, I didn't even think about that, but yeah, it does. That's hilarious. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my. But, uh, yeah, they uh, moved out there, and, you know, they had three kids, and Mrs. Mavis, her name was Valtroud, had been married three times. Her um, other two children were from the first marriage, and then Armin was the only one by the second marriage. Okay. Um, and it kind of made me think through that. If that dynamic wouldn't be somewhat close to what we see quite often with adoption, where, um, you know, we see that that has messed quite a few of these people up. But yeah, people I, get people get really weird about, you know, who's my kid, who's not my kid, you know, but who's not my biological kid and, mm-hmm. and how what the hell difference does it make? You know, yeah. it's it's the fa- this is now the family. Just accept everyone. Oh, yeah. Jesus, it's not that complicated. Oh, I completely agree. I was just bringing that up because no, no, I wonder uh, if it is close to the adoption thing that we see. But... Well, it, it, adoption or not, there's you know there's the you know this somebody's the stepkids. Yeah, yeah, you kind of get that sort of unconsciously with the parents. Yeah, you know showing favor to one or the other. But, yeah, um, Armin's father left when he was eight. And there's a rather sad story going around with that. Yeah, Armin recalled um, playing in the garden by the house with one of the only other boys in Wusterfeld. And he heard the door slam on their manor. And his dad just walked out to the car, got in there, drove away. And poor eight-year-old Armin is running after him and, you know, begging him to turn around. 
Um, wow. Not saying that we should necessarily sympathize with these guys, but with stories like that, it's kind of hard not to. Well, in my uh, yeah, uh, you know, everybody everybody lives through traumas of one kind or another, uh, varying degrees, and most people don't end up eating somebody over it or killing Correct. somebody or raping or kidnapping or torturing and all this bullshit that people mm-hmm. do to each other you know some do though yeah and it's really it's interesting to look at why those some do yes but, yeah it, yeah oftentimes you know there's um you know there's there's less gray matter in the uh, hippocampus yeah for oh yeah um on on the physiological side right definitely plus there's there you know in in a lot of these cases there's not just one trauma but a you know Mm -hmm. a long litany yeah and that's the that's the thing with armin it can be kind of hard to find some of those others Mm -hmm. that um diverge from this theme that sort of started when his dad left, which was loneliness, um, profound, deep loneliness. His two brothers left not long after his dad. They were probably, that, they were considerably older, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And that left just him and Valtraud, his mother in the house. And she was dictatorial. <laughs> Putting, no. Putting it nicely. What? <laughs> she um, would require and would make Armin wear um, traditional old-fashioned lederhosen to school oh, every day. man. Ouch. Yeah. And then she would also um, quite often uh, reprimand or admonish him in public, too. Her uh, favorite words there were calling him worthless and then calling him Minchin, which is a uh, term used for a girl in the German language. Yes. Um, so you, you get into all that, and as he grew up, he, uh, his relationships were, of course, very often highly regulated by her, too. But um, it was around this time as well that he sort of discovered cannibalism it was first um not just in the robinson crusoe like we were talking about Mm -hmm. but it was actually just a bit before that it was hansel and gretel oh and and not just that story but you know there are plenty of fairy tales about eating children which were used you know they were intended to scare children uh, when they were originally created because Bad things did go on in the woods, and, and maybe not, you know, cannibals, but plenty of wild animals and just plain getting lost and shit like that. Yep. Um, so scare the kids to not wander off. Yep. And that was, in huge part, their purpose. Um, but that fascinated him, and then he read Robinson Crusoe when he was 10. And... Um, I guess the part in there is Robinson saves his friend from the cannibals. I've never read it. Oh, uh, Man Friday, right? Yeah. He, he he was, I think he wasn't the, a friend, but another uh, castaway. Or he was, um, he might have been a castaway, but from a different ship. Or some somebody he found on the island. Um, and I'm basing this on movies that I've seen, movie versions. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't remember exactly um, where the other guy came from, but they, uh, yeah, saved him from the cannibals, yes. And they basically became close after that, right? Right, right. Okay. Yeah, they became that's a team. I, oh, that's where I was. So, so look what that does in, in little... Uh, Armin's Armin's brain, right? 
Yeah, and that's a cannibal where I was... can make you can make, bring you friends. Yeah, I was wondering if that was the association there, just like that, or if he was sort of identifying with the bad guys too. So I think that um, it's kind of up in the air, yeah. but um, as we'll see, he really wasn't that much of a sadist. But uh, yeah, I mean, after well, well I, I mean, just to, to poke at that a little bit more, you know, he he could have had you know just you know he probably wasn't very old anyway, maybe a preteen or a teen when he read that book. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you know the wires get kind of jumbled up. You know the signals. You know, ooh, cannibals. Ooh, these two became friends. Ooh, cannibals made friends. Cannibals mean friends. You know, it's not it's not a huge leap to mm-hmm. go from you know cannibals made these two guys buddies to you know cannibals are friends <laughs> or something like that. You know. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, I, I totally agree there. And that's where you uh, get into looking at this further. That's also when the fantasy started for him, mm-hmm. where he wanted to um, eat his friends to keep them with him, as he said, where they would never leave me. Right. Uh, and, it, you know, it's kind of weird. At that same time, he also started a uh, imaginary friend that he named Frankie. And that was a uh, imaginary younger brother for him mm. that he also had, but you know he's a very creative, very fantasy driven guy. He also would often create and write down his own fairy tales. Really? Um, yeah. Yeah, That's and it's nice. just it's how he occupied his time. I never um, had imaginary friends. I, it never even occurred to me to make up, you know, some f- imaginary friend. It just, hell, the house was crowded enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, when you have a 40-some room manor house and nobody well, you your know, age to share it with. Think about how just the space would contribute to his sense of loneliness. You know, oh, absolutely. These endless hallways and rooms and with nobody there. And then the town has almost nobody there. And there's like one other boy in the whole fucking town. And, yep. you know, there's just no nothing there for him. Oh, absolutely. And um, throughout this time, I mean, as he's getting older... He's also basically his mother's houseboy most of the time. Sure. Um, he never really went out or anything. Um, and he, when he was 18, he joined the army, the West German army, and became a uh, supply officer. But the problem there, <laughs> where he was stationed, wasn't far at all from oh. his mother in the house. Didn't, so he, he, ended he tried up to get him. away and he couldn't get far enough. Right. Right. And he, uh, you know, he stayed in there for a long time and he thought maybe I can make this into a career. But his fellow soldiers saw him as a pushover for the most part. Sure. And, um, you know, it just it didn't really work out for him throughout all that. Well, and, he uh, would have, you know, a lot of times people in that kind of a dynamic they'll go one of two ways they become either hyper combative uh with their with authority figures or they become very obsequious um Mm -hmm. you know clawing uh just you know yeah pushovers Uh, do anything to you know keep the peace and 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 garner any kind of uh positive attention mm-hmm. oh absolutely i mean the, just his, his mother's influence i'm sure really drove that into him um and also likely laid the seeds for his fantasies of total domination over another person 
you know, in the act of eating them. Um, But it was around this time as well that his mother became actually bedridden with cancer. So this just laying more Mm. on his plate. And um, he is charged with taking care of her, you know, through uh, most of the day. Right. And he also takes a job where I guess he telecommuted. Um, working with computers okay, for a uh, bunch of different businesses and institutions there. Um, you know, you, and, and when, when, how, how, you know, confusing would that have to have been, you know, here's this person who he wants love and attention from, who probably never gives it to him and he resents her to just endlessly. And yet now he's got to take care of her. Oh yeah. And it, absolutely. And he ends up doing that of course, until she dies in 1999 and during through all of this, he's also refining his um, cannibalistic tendencies, his fantasies mm. And with the internet, it allows him to sort of um, understand that there's more people out there like him. And it is with the advent of that, and shortly mm-hmm. after Valtroud's death in 1999, that he you know, realizes, I can give fuller reign to these desires. Yeah. So he starts putting ads out on different forums online and um we actually i screen grab yeah i i i've got those a few of them i've got those in a slideshow just pull that uh, up yeah you could still find it via the uh way back machine and if you uh dig hard enough but any of them that you see on there frankie was mavis's alias on that forum. Okay. And he um, would often put the ads out for 18 to 30 year olds, typically. And I was just looking for it because I wrote down the. Uh, yeah, here's August 28, verbatim. 2002. If you are between 18 and 30 years old and have you a normal build body, then come to me. I will. Butchering and eating your fine flesh. Please email mm-hmm. me your age, hi, and why, weight, and if you can, with a pic, Frankie. And the um, other one that was on there, I also screen grabbed a couple of the more typical yeah. posts from the forum. Um, but yeah, that was one of them. And this one he put up after the murder that he was charged with which we uh, will um, be getting into. Because uh, the guy that he killed burned Jürgen Brandes, who um, also met him through here, was killed in um, 2001. Oh, okay. And basically what happened with that was, Bern is a uh, another computer guy, but he's in Berlin. He's um, bisexual, he had a rather long relationship with a female cabbie in Berlin, and they were going to get married, but then he just up and told her, I'm gay. And that stopped it. Um, it usually does. <laughs> yep. Then they uh, interviewed, well, they um, took testimony from, rather, a uh, boyfriend of Burns, who said that he had often offered him 3,300 pounds to castrate him with his teeth to bite off Burns' penis. Wait, who made that offer? Burns made that offer to the boyfriend, a guy by the name of Victor Serrano. Wow. And he made it apparently several times. Um. And Serrano, of course, always said, no, I'm not going to do that. And I don't know how it lasted for a total of three years, their relationship, but it managed to. 
And then um, Serrano said that, hey, this is what ultimately drove me away. He wants this kind of mutilation too bad. Hmm. Um, but Byrne then found a, uh, another guy by the name of Rene, who was more level-headed, um, according to the people who interviewed him. Um, but Byrne, he uh, met Mavis, and they talk online for a while. And ultimately, he takes a day off of work and heads to the town by Mavis, a town called Castle, K-A-S-S-E-L, via the train. And in the process, he's clearing all sorts of evidence that this is where he's going from, like, his hard drives and everywhere else. And then he's also getting his will ready and leaving everything to Rene hmm. in the process there. And um, before all that, he had also sent off, or sold off, rather, his possessions, most of them, including the uh, sports car that he loved. And I was just pulling this up real quick while we're talking. Here is a transcription of a few of their emails. Now, um, Brandy went by the alias Kador99. And then you have on this one, Mavis went by um, Anthropophagus as his alias, which, by the way, means cannibal in um, Latin. Oh, does it? So, K yes. Kador99 says, Hello, um, Anthropophagus. Hi, Kador. What do you do professionally that you are up so late at night? Kador, I can't sleep well anymore because of our meeting. Anthropophagus, that's a sensible reason. Yesterday I was incredibly tired. It was a stressful day. Kador 99, I'm in telecommunications. Anthropophagus, oh, that sounds interesting. Kador, I believe you. Anthropophagus, I'm looking forward to our meeting. It will definitely be really cool. Kador, I want it to be. I hope it'll be really cool. Are you setting an alarm clock? Anthropophagus, it's only a few days until March 9th. Kador, still, I would still I would have rather met you yesterday and felt your teeth. Anthropophagus, one can't have everything. There's still some time before you really feel my teeth. Kador, I hardly know what to expect. Have you slaughtered a man before? Anthropophagus, unfortunately, only in my dreams, but in my thoughts, I do it every night. Kador, so I'm the first. You have eaten human flesh before, or you haven't? Anthropophagus, no, you don't exactly find it in the supermarket, unfortunately. Mm. Kador, how do you know if it will taste good to you, or that the blood won't make you sick? Anthropophagus, I'm readying myself with my dreams. Once I was so excited, I grabbed a needle and drew my own blood so I could drink it. Kador, in your blood, it tasted good to you? Antropo, it was quite tasty. Once I was drilling some holes and the drill slipped right into my hand. That was a real treat. Blood is the juice of life. It contains everything a person needs for nutrition. Kador, then I hope you won't wilt that you can really see it through without a problem. Antropophagus. To bite into your penis will certainly not be easy. Living flesh is somewhat more resistant than fried. But one thing is certain, our dream will be fulfilled. Kador, but there's not much in it as there is in muscle. Anthropophagus, yeah, but the penis is principally a spongy material filled with blood. Kador, for both our sakes, I hope that's true. I hope you have also already thought about what's to be done with the rest. Fulfilling the dream shouldn't become a nightmare for you. No one will know where I've disappeared to. Antropo, after you're dead, I'll take you out and expertly carve you up. Except for a pair of knees and some fleshy trash, skin, cartilage, tendons, there won't be much of you left. Kador, there will be a good bit like the knees. I hope you have a good hiding place for them. Antropo, I'll dry out the knees and grind them up soon after. Kador, okay, they're good as fertilizer. I heard that once. I see you've thought about it. Good, sounds like I'm the first. Antropo, and you won't be the last, hopefully. 
I've already considered catching a young person from the street, but I would rather kill only those who want to be killed. Kador, that also doesn't sound bad, but yeah, seeing as it's not so totally legal, this is in my eyes better than yanking somebody directly up the street. Antropo, exactly, I'd do it if it were legal. <laughs> so, oh. yeah, that little combo, That's I think, how... it's a good window. It's chilling how casual they are about the whole thing, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. That was pu- that was published in Harper's Magazine. Wow. Drop it in the chat. But yeah, I mean, that's how they were planning it, and March ninth is when they met. And firstly, what they do was. Uh, Mavis picked him up from the train station and then they went and got a bottle of painkillers, schnapps, and a bottle of cold and cough medicine. Hmm. And um, they go back to the manor and they uh, have sex, make some coffee, and then um, it was actually Brandis who started getting cold feet about the whole thing. And he says, take me back to the train station. But in the process, he downs the uh, schnapps, the cold medicine, and the pain meds. Oopsie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then he looks at And then according to Mavis, Mavis says he um, said, take me back. Let's try it again. Oh. And if, if you believe that. I mean, is there a you know question what? of whether he you... talked him into it under the influence of that? Yeah, he might have. I mean, it's plausible that somebody would have second, third, fourth thoughts about going through with it. Oh, absolutely. But then you introduce the mind-altering substances in, and you can't exactly consent to you know, much of anything. Yeah, it depends how long after, how how much time has elapsed. Well, I, I mean, it was a good amount of time. But, yeah, anyway, they go back, and Mavis had built a slaughter room into the house. It was soundproofed, and it had a system of pulleys. Was um, this his parents' house, the giant house out in the boondocks? Yes, ah, perfect. the manor, right? The manor house, yep. Um, but yeah, he built that room with the um, bondage cross, the St. Andrew's cross, and pulleys and meat hooks and all this stuff in it. And he um, took Brandy's in there when he was damn near out cold from everything. And um, they tried to sever his penis. And he wouldn't do it when he tried biting. It just you know, wouldn't get come it. off. Yeah. Right. So he goes and he gets a uh, knife and severs it. And after that, he ends up cutting it in half and trying to um, feed half of it to Brandis. And Brandis... Lorraine and Bobbin could have told him to <laughs> use a knife. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she could have helped him refine his technique, but yeah, Brandis ended up complaining that it was too tough, that he couldn't chew through it. Wow. So Mavis takes the, um, what's left of it, downstairs, and he cooks it with garlic, salt, and pepper, and um, Brandis' own body fat to try to fry it. But it ended up just um, burning it to nothing. And he uh, fed it to his dog after. So, you know, meanwhile, Brandis is up there just bleeding out in this room. And um, Mivis ends up taking him and moving him to a bathtub to make the cleanup a little bit easier. And he uh, basically just lets him sit there. For about three hours and goes downstairs, watches a Disney movie, and then starts reading a Star Trek novel. Wow. 
<laughs> yeah. Just letting him bleed out slowly. Yep. Not, not, you know, adding any, you know, artery cuts or anything. Nope. Wow. Nope, not yet. It was after the uh, three hours when it was into the next morning and he noticed that he was still alive, that he took a uh, knife and stabbed him eight times in the throat. And that's ultimately what killed him. Interesting. And um, from there is where he gets into the actual dismemberment part of it all. And that gets into the pictures that we have. Yes, yeah, all yeah. of this. They'll, they'll be coming all, around. All of this was videotaped by Mavis. The entire thing. And he even got um, Brandis's. Uh, consent on the video beforehand. Oh. Saying, I want to be eaten. And that is what, you know, that's what really stymied so much of the progress with this in court when they finally arrested him, but we'll get to that. Um, there you see where he bisected him. And drained what blood was left into the bucket below. Wow. So, so, from a legal perspective, I think the mistake he made is not having the victim commit suicide. Yeah. I mean, that is what they tried to argue with the uh, first trial of it. That he um, was just basically an accessory to euthanasia for brand brandies but but he wasn't no <laughs> no that whole thing kind of falls apart but it, it, it falls apart when he stabs him in the neck <laughs> yeah yeah well there's that part and then it, to me the definition of euthanasia is somebody who when you know they're of sound mind mm -hmm. has said i want to be killed if i'm in x state right you know if i'm in a if i'm a vegetable or if i have an incurable disease and right. brandis it's pretty clear to me that he's been suicidal for a long time i would think you know even if he um was very adept at hiding that from his friends and his family. I he, I would argue he just wasn't in the right mind to consent to anything. Well, yeah, that's a tough call, though, isn't it? Huh? I mean, I mean, it, I mean, he. This had been going. This they didn't just meet in a pub and decide to go upstairs and you know, get killed and eaten. This was an right. ongoing thing over quite a bit of time. This was right. not a spur of the moment event. Right. And I mean, they knew, you know, each other. Yeah. And he, and he had, you know, he had to travel a significant distance just to get there. There's, you know, there's a lot of opportunities and he claimed you know, he even admitted that he changed his mind a couple of times. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. So, so you know, on the, and, uh, so maybe he he was capable of consenting, or, but you could also at the same time argue that anybody who would consent is not in their right mind. Right. That, yeah, I and mean, it gets closer to that. I mean, it's almost like saying that somebody who is in who is in inpatient uh, psychiatric care for suicidal ideation is capable of consenting when they're suicidal. You know, and right. to me, yeah, it's just no, it's not accurate. But at any rate, despite all of that, you have again the variable of him being very drunk and very stoned at the time mm -hmm. we, 
language um, inhibits consent even further. Um, that is Brandy's right there with the glasses, by the way. Okay. But um, yeah, he Mavis ended up butchering his body, and he actually ate about forty-four pounds of them before he was caught. And how did that come about? He was caught after he started looking for another victim. Oh. Which you um, look at the uh, various screen grabs from the website mm -hmm. that I took. And um, that was around the time right after when he started looking again. It was about five months after he killed um, Brandy's. And there was a uh, medical student by the name of Reinhold who was reading a lot of what Mivis was saying on the, uh, on the forums. And he looked at this and he's like, you know, this guy is getting into a lot of detail what he said he did with this other man. Right. And I'm pretty sure that this is murder. So what he did was he turned it over to the German police. Here's the August 18th, 2002 post up on the screen now. Yep, that was one of them where he Trying was to find sending it. it out as a lure. Yeah. Mm hmm And yeah, that's ultimately what caught him. And then with that first trial, that was where they were trying to argue um, euthanasia. And they were successful for the most part with that, actually. He only got eight and a half years. But he made the mistake of appealing it. Oh. <laughs> and, and they why, sent and it why, to... Why was that a mistake? It's, oh, usually, that some... it's usually not a... It's usually like a... You, no lose situation when you appeal something, right? If you look at the American system, it is. Yeah. But over in Germany, he appealed because, again, he didn't believe that he did anything wrong throughout this. Okay. And what ultimately happened there was this other court looked at it and said, no, eight and a half years is way too lenient. So oh. they gave him a life sentence. But for, in Germany, a life sentence typically only means 15 years. And then you're out. Okay. But, but. in um, 2018, Mivas had lost his bid to um, get parole, basically. Oh. So he's still in prison, thankfully. I think it's kind of unequivocal that he would probably kill again. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, if, 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 if he had never gone after anybody else, he'd still be out there, right? Oh, yeah, most likely. But hey, I was going to say he got a taste for murder. That's a little bit on the nose. <laughs> well, and he did. Yeah. You know, human flesh. And his big thing there, I think, again, was loneliness. He felt, you know, completed. Yeah. When he would eat somebody. And he even believed that he had taken on Brandis's masculinity from doing that. And no kidding that he took on his English language aptitude. Uh, clearly not, him. judging from his post. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know that that uh, that concept of uh, acquiring the attributes of whatever you eat, you know, that's that's a very ancient philosophy. It uh, is. Um, you know, you see it in Native Americans. I mean, all over the world, you see this kind of thing. You know. Uh, and it's it's definitely uh, he didn't come up with it. It's been around a long time. Oh yeah, I mean that's something that's almost a uh, cultural universal in a lot of areas. Yeah, there's also no basis for it in science. 
<laughs> right. Right. I mean, it's just, yeah, essentially. It's a, it's, uh, it's a spirituality kind of thing. Mystical. Yes. It's a mystical um, concept. Right. Yeah. Non-scientific, but still a common belief. Mm-hmm. And 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 very true in the uh, among cannibal cultures. Mm-hmm. I was thinking we should do a show on an anthropological look at cannibalism sometime. Be interesting. Yeah, th- very true. I mean, you know, the uh, the um, the people the government of New Guinea was finally able, it took a long time, but they were able to convince the, their local cannibal tribes to give it up because they were getting sick and dying from eating the uh, brain stems and stuff. Oh man. Um, and they said, look, this is, this is bad for you. Yeah. Oh Yeah. <laughs> That's one reason that they theorize that it's taboo in a lot of areas too, is because it can cause that. Yeah. If you get like a, uh, yeah, a disease or a parasite in your brain. Yeah, I I think if I remember right, it's it's kind of a human equivalent of mad cow kind of a uh, type of disease that you get. Dang. Yeah, that would suck. Although we should also stress with all this that cannibalism in itself is not a crime. Even in the U.S.? Even in the U.S. The best that they could do with something like that is getting the person for murder Mm -hmm. or getting them for something like desecrating a corpse. Hmm. There is no specific statute that makes cannibalism illegal. Yeah, we ran yeah. across that in a in a different case a couple of months ago, didn't we? Oh, did we? Yeah. I'm trying to remember which one that yeah, was. Yeah, I can't remember now either. <laughs> but I remember, yeah. now that you bring that up, I remember talking about how that was not a crime that they could catch this guy on. Yep. Yep, they have to get him on the more uh, tertiary type stuff to it like murder or desecrating a corpse that sort of thing yeah wow yeah so any uh would-be cannibals out there don't commit murder in the process of eating someone (laughs) well and don't talk about it online for fuck's sakes (laughs) uh Oddly enough, that is the reason that Mivis says he is writing his memoirs in prison to keep people from picking up the fork and knife. Hmm. Uh, he is also, um, according to authorities, become a strict vegetarian. Really? Mm-hmm. That's that sounds a lot like uh, finding Jesus in jail to me. <laughs> Right. Yeah, for the cannibal equivalent. Right. Definitely. I guess with most of it, when he chopped it up, he would eat it as steaks, but then he also took quite a bit of it and made meatballs oh, out man. of it. Yeah. Yep. To cook it with garlic and other herbs and um, some type of sauce, too. There is a slang term. I got to. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think I heard about it through Archer. <laughs> oh, yeah. The show. They call it uh, some cannibalistic tribes, I believe. I mean, maybe it's an urban legend. They call human long pig. Oh, no, that's accurate. Yeah. Yeah, that is actually very accurate. Um, I can't remember where I was reading it when I was doing this research, but yeah. They do. Oh, and the uh, other pictures in our rotation here of the uh, German police tape in front of the house and the uh, guy in the suit is actually the cannibal cop from Germany. Yeah, I can pull Not to be up. confused. Yeah. 
Not to be confused with the uh, cannibal cop over here who didn't actually do anything. Right. Um, Gil, who uh, I don't believe we've told everybody, will likely be coming on our show. No definitive date. Nice. But yeah, he said he'd be up to come on for a conversation. But um, this guy was 2013 over in um, East Germany and Prussia. That guy. He was um, arrested for, again, finding a willing victim. But oddly enough, he didn't eat any of them. He just killed him and buried him. Oh, well, that's um, that's kind of the inexcusable side of the equation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really is. I mean, you you can you can consent to be eaten, and and maybe you can get away with, you know, no no charges being filed, but you can't consent to being killed. Yeah, that is an impossibility. But, yeah, it's interesting how all of this that happened when you have the profoundly masochistic, the profoundly self-hating, meeting the profoundly lonely. Yeah. Just both their pathologies are so weird. But it also gets into a... uh, more overarching theme that actually would bring um, both of them to bear. And that was the theme of what's called vorare philia. And And it's very rarely studied, but it's people who have usually a, a paraphilia or a sexual attraction to being swallowed. Pull. Often... I, some of the sources I saw on this said that it did not involve chewing. Varare philia does not involve chewing. Oh, but actually being, like, swallowed by a giant anaconda or something. Yeah. A lot of the times it's giant animals, or sometimes it's uh, macrophilia, which is giant people mm. that would be doing it. But... Um, There's other sources that say that that chewing distinction doesn't really matter, too. But um, the vorari philia, it can cover being eaten, but it can also cover the eating side. Huh. So I guess it would be kind of a uh, continuum, not unlike sadism and masochism. Okay. Where, you know, you have people who are very uh, strong on one pole of that, but sometimes they might drift more towards the other, too. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it, is is that like... I don't know. It, I have this sense of swaddling, you know, of being... Um, you know, one of the things that people like, who people who like to be bound and tied up, um, they like mm-hmm. that tight feeling of, you know, that sec- feeling of being physically secured. Um, and this mm-hmm. seems kind of related to that, right? Cause you, yeah, you're, actually. You're completely um, surrounded by something very close and very warm. Something close to a womb. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there is definitely that. Um, and quite often, Varari philia will intersect with other paraphilias, too, like I said. Yeah. But um, there's also a variant of it that involves just um, being sucked back into the uh, uterus and the womb. Hmm. That that is there paraphilia but you know as uh physical boundaries quite often make enacting mm-hmm. varari philia impossible what they'll yeah. usually do is go to the internet with um text descriptions stories drawings that sort of thing you know the internet is really great uh for helping people to realize you know, that the things that they're going through, they're not the only ones. 
And the downside of that is that it really helps people realize that they're not the only ones going through what they're going through. And, you know, people who do very, very bad things can also hook up with other people. <laughs> yep. And it's a dual-edged sword. There's no doubt about it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think there is no question whatsoever that um, Brandy's had Ferrariphilia. Right. Um. And then I guess maybe well, I mean, if you go with that one definition. It seems like anybody who would, you know, want to be eaten would have that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It's just too bad there hasn't been more um, study on it. It's like I said, it's kind of a nebulous concept still because of that. Sure. Well, I can imagine that it's not exactly easy to come across, um, you know subjects to study yeah where the best you could do is maybe find some on a chat room somewhere yeah. who would be willing Better to hurry talk while they're fresh <laughs> <laughs> yep absolutely all righty well i gotta say that is um sounds like our show for this week i believe so I think we built, beat the hell out of the Cannibal of Rotenberg. Very tasty show this week. <laughs> uh, All right. Bye. Good night, everybody. Good night.